session. And we will also um, host a few more sessions like today um, in the future, just to make sure that we incorporate uh, the voices from different thinkers and also wider civil society organizations um, on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so the output of this session, we will incorporate the output into an invitation to the wider society to talk about different ideas for the future and how we get there. And so this way we can, we can move towards um, or beyond recovery and renewal towards a fair and just society. Mm -hmm. So I have, in, uh, because we, there are so many people are, are interested in joining today's session. So we don't have much time to introduce each one, but I still want to make sure that um, like we, we, we hear from everyone. So ju just um, for everyone, I have put 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 down uh, the, the table where we're sitting uh, <laughs> and also your name, um, your role and why you're relevant um, to radical civics um, because of the work that you're doing. Um, so feel free to just look at um, different people in the room and can we just hear briefly from each of you, just your name and your expectation um, of today, like what you want to get out of today, just really briefly, it doesn't need to be long. So should we start from Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> sure, we can. Um, wait, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was wondering if I was on mute. Um, so, you know, I've for many years, I've been really interested in the intersection of governance, innovation, and activism, community organizing. I've had a few experiences working with the city and government, feeling like there was a lot of unnecessary divisions in between the two. Like some people were purposely keeping them separate rather than actively creating the bridges and creating new forms of relating to each other. And I, in that sense, I've been really inspired by the work uh, of Audrey. Um, and so I'm really excited for us to um, explore that further today um and i'm i'm helping fang to uh facilitate the session uh and i'm with dark matter labs bon matin tout le monde live from montreal thank you jonathan um himanshu do you want to go next yeah i can go next hi i'm manchu i also work at dark matter labs and uh, uh i hold uh, uh strategic and digital design and uh I've, I've also been interested in this intersection of governance and participation and sort of bridging this uh, gap of participation for real democracy that we see exists. And I'm working on a project relating to contracting and how we could use the tools of contracting to further some of this. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I'm joining in from Malmö, Sweden. Thank you, Himanshu. I'll just follow my, my screen and see who is next. So next is Nick. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm Nick um, from Shift, and I'm um, calling in from London. And um, yeah, really excited to join you all, see you all. Um, so I think m the most uh, kind of resonant and relevant part of this project for me is as we, you know, we spend a lot of time working uh, in communities on, uh, in, uh, on, say, for example, local food systems and find ourselves often very uncomfortably forced to subscribe to a kind of yeah, a government uh, based model of kind of, you know, service provider service users or a very market kind of um, bound model of kind of um, of uh, which which is kind of rooted within some very unequal distribution of 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 kind of the ability to navigate that market and 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 our work suffers and our spirit suffers and i think inhabiting the space that you've been describing is something we we hold we seek and it's very precious when we find it but it's very under resourced it's very difficult to inhabit for very long and this kind of civic space that isn't reliant on or bound by either of those two models is something we just we want to understand better inhabit more often um and uh and support others to to do the same so um yeah, it continued to be very interested in exploring that with you all. Thank you, Nick. Next, we have Hyojong. 
Hi, I'm Hye Jung Lee, I'm visual communication designer at Dark Matter Labs. And I'm focusing, um, I will focusing on um, how to visualize to um, make people to, um, to understand and use the framework as a tool um, better um, um, through, um, the, through the conversation of today. Thank you, Hyojung. And next we have Audrey. Well, hi, I'm Audrey, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. Um, I'm here today because Fanri invited me to. Uh, I'm open to uh, any possibility. I don't really want to get anything out of this conversation other than to get to know you all. Thank you, Audrey. Um, next we have Cassie. Hey, Cassie, are you there? I find Cassie wrote in the chat. Uh, she's sorry, she won't be, she's only able to type in the chat for now. So oh, right. No worries, no worries. Somewhere yeah. between Cambridge and London. Cool. Thank you, Cassie. Next, we have Juhi. Hello, this is Juhi, also coming from uh, Dagmar Lab, uh, located in Seoul, in South Korea. And uh, my expectation is like, uh, first of all, like interest in like how to bring agency to the civil society and let them um, build uh, their thriving community uh, with a like agency of governance. That's like one domain perspective interest and uh, also expectation. And the other one is like how to make it open a provocation. So that's that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Juhi. Next, we have Gordon. Hello, uh, I'm also from Dark Matter Labs, currently in Delhi, India. And I've seen Audrey give live talks or seen videos, and I'm a big fan of, I mean, I can go, let's uh, open that. But like, I think my expectation and what I've been thinking these days is most about ecological media. And what I mean by that is like, you know, taking tech and seeing the invisible structures behind it, be it the materiality or be it like the extractive models or be it like, you know, yeah. How how do we reach more ecological tech? Thank you, Gordon. And then next we have Indy. Okay. Um, um, Indy from Dark Matters in London. I'm, I'm super excited to be in this room. And I suppose my my aspiration is that, um, or my have, um, provocation is that I think we're in a, at a moment where, certainly in the West, the monopoly of government and the monopoly of private sector are both problematic, certainly in a Western context now. And actually, there is a space for a new radical civics to actually create a new power relationship, and which will actually make everyone better. And I'm very interested, and I think Bitcoin is a is a kind of bad example of a good civic, anyway. And there might be a really interesting exploration of what that sort of distributed decentralized agency or production starts to create a new type of relationship. And I think this can go from money production, this can go from legals, this can go to all sorts of what we registries and how do we create a new civic infrastructure of society, which creates the multiplicity of public. And I'm, I think this moment is right now, and I'm super excited to be here, to be able to discuss this and see what we can develop together out, out, out of that. And I have kind of a bit of an ambition around this, which is I think we should be building something quite radical in partnership with the Audrey around at a global level about building a fund to support this sort of radical capabilities around the world. So anyway, that's my ambition. <laughs> Thank you, Indy. And I'm Fong from Dark Matter Labs. I'm also working with Audrey. I'm really happy to be here and hosting this conversation um, with Jonathan. And so we, we are going to explore um, uh, different strengths of discussion and I will just quickly um, relate to like the work that Audrey, what Audrey is doing um, and how that intersects with the four different strengths of our um, inquiry. So the first one um, is around power distribution and decision-making um, and sovereignty as a foundation of emancipation. I think Audrey's, Audrey's work um, around 
the open source movement and open knowledge, like Mongdi and the MOE dictionary, and a lot of um, other different. Um, basically, Audrey is quite hands on on a lot of um, civic civic tech uh, projects, and also another um, initiative related to what Audrey is working on is um, the the open government um, mission that invites different um, stakeholders from all sectors to be able to discuss regulations and policy and come up with solutions together. Um, and I see that as an alternative representation or a, how a liquid democracy can be practiced through the mechanism. For example, like in Taiwan practitioners or like online participators that join uh, assemblies, for example, they, they are able to represent themselves or delegate their representation to other people who they trust in order to kind of, as, a, as opposed to um, voting for uh, representatives every few years. And these are the only people who represent um, our voices. I see that as a very dynamic way of practicing um, democratic innovation. So this is definitely the area that we are going to talk about first. The second one is around radical civic space. So the way maybe it's worth talking about the space um, at the moment. So we can see like the old framework or the, the this framework from um, the, the bowling triangle that we can see the, the different like the separate, I wouldn't say separation, but just differentiation between different sectors. And the way, if we want to use this as a framework to point out where the radical civic space is, um, probably it would be like around here where um, civic action is not something that um, civil society only um, has to tap in or, or certain things like state doesn't only have the responsibility to take care of uh, people's welfare and providing public services like all those things um sh if all all the different things are public uh, interest focus there is a space for that that radical civic um, actions and then um that is a space where the people can make society together so that's the, the, the how we see um, um, the meaning of radical civic space. So within this uh, strand of inquiry, as Audrey in the beginning mentioned, that uh, the 1922 SMS is a very good example. Probably I will just give the, the, the opportunity for Audrey to mention about that, because I find this is very interesting. Um, because in the UK, we also have like contact tracing. Like if you go to a shop, you just scan, you download an app and then you scan, then you, then you will be, you will know um, where you are and then the systems will, will track um, everyone's movement just for, for purpose, um, like disease control purposes. Um, but what I find interesting for uh, this example is that um, the same, the same initiative happen from the perspective of civil society and not only civil society, but also how government and private sectors are working together to realize this space for public goods. Uh, instead of saying tra like contact tracing is the purely responsibility of the government or different sectors. So Audrey, do you wanna just jump in and briefly talk about, talk sure. about this? Yeah, which is a very uh, good example of a radical sure. civic space. <laughs> well, the, the unifying um, value of the 192 SMS is inclusion. Uh, we specifically want to uh, take care of people with p feature phones who could not install an app for QR code sc scanning. We specifically want to include people who do not have, uh, for example, the capacity uh, to use a browser or understand how a browser works and so on. We also want to uh, take care of people who think the line, which is equivalent of WhatsApp, uh, is the, the only thing on the phone that they are comfortable with and so on. So uh, the design brief is essentially co-created by uh, the people in the GovZero community over just around 
24 hours a weekend, uh, and then we converged on the SMS-based uh, status. And then uh, in the name of inclusion and in the name of social norm, uh, then on Monday, I work with the five telecom carriers and convince them to waive the fees uh, that sent to the 1922 SMS. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we then work with the private sector to make sure the five telecoms, who, which are in the private sector, uh, are able to uh, delete the SMS uh, after 28 days, uh, make sure that the location code is randomized, uh, making sure that the, the privacy budget is well spent through multi-party computation, and so on. Uh, and the company that built the eMask uh, system a year ago for mask rationing and pre-ordering basically completed the system uh, and rolled it out and worked with all the small private uh, sector vendors, including nine market stands and so on, in another 24 hours. So uh, in three short days, uh, basically the first day, the social sector sets the norm. The second day, the public sector amplifies the norm. Uh, and then the third day, the private sector implements the norm. And then we had a almost perfectly working SMS checking system. The only shortcoming is the uh, roaming service people, people who use telecoms other than the domestic ones. Uh, but we're fixing that tomorrow uh, with an app rollout by Taipei Municipality. Thank you, Audrey. That's really amazing. The last, uh, sorry, there's there are two more. Um, the third strands of um, inquiry is around civic law or soft law. We're still trying to find the best language for that, um, which is essentially like talking about laws are stories. They're based on our knowledge and behavior and customs. And if those behavior are the foundation of um, like what constitute law and how we organize together, then could, could we intervene in that space to um, find the way that we can make law leg more legible and also more legit the process of making law can be more legitimate and and also we can enforce those of law um, through peer-to-peer -peer feedback. and. And this is super relevant to also Audrey's uh, contribution in Vita One, another project around participate, particip participatory lawmaking. So we will tap into this um, later on. And last one, um, I'm not sure if we have time to go, go into this, but essentially this is about um, the funding mechanisms and how we value things in the space in order to see radical civics happening in a more financially sustainable and environmentally sustainable way. Um, so just to quick wrap up um, what radical civic is, I think we wanna um, push further the idea of what um, civil society uh, really means and how people can be um, participating, having the agency and autonomy to make the society, no matter who they are from what, what sector. So it's definitely not exclusive, uh, this exclusive domain, but quite the opposite, how we can all work together, even we have different backgrounds. And so the characteristic of Radical Civic is uh, really um, public interest centered, um, social goal centered. And, and just to mention that, um, the work is supported by the Emerging Futures Fund, and we're collaborating on this project uh, with SHIFT. So before we go into the future imagining session, Audrey, do you, would you want to um, say anything or is there anything come, come out of your mind when you go through the provocation? Um, and fine, uh, I'll just do a little time check in here. Um, ideally, how much time should we have for this exercise before the collective imagining session? Uh, probably five, five, five minutes. minutes? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Um, so two things. Um, uh, the first thing is that the, the way that you use the Venn diagram uh, shows that it's a kind of overlapping space between the three sectors. Uh, but I, I have in mind a, a more kind of transcultural or rather um, 
we say cross-sectoral, transcultural, because it's not just about finding the overlap between the three sectors. It's about the three sectors um, stops being something that people identify with. That is to say, I'm not uh, saying that I am a public servant. Uh, I say I have the experience uh, to work with uh, the government, not for the government, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of saying I am a business person, uh, I say I, I, I have the experience of working with the market uh, and so on. This is uh, essential because that decouples our identity from our uh, sectoral experiences. And I think uh, the Venn diagram um, sometimes would seem like uh, that one person simply has multiple um, identities or, or is a slash, as we say here in Taiwan and so on. But but I think that is still caught in the uh, identity experience um, kind of confusion uh, that we have experience in across sectors. It's not that we identify with multiple sectors. That's the first um, mm. idea that, that came to my mind. Uh, the, the second uh, idea is around the, um, there's a specific, um, metaphor, right, that, that you use, that the root. Um, so like being radical is going to the root uh, of things. Um, and that inspired me to think about, uh, because I, I also say radical transparency, right? I'm also board member of radical exchange. So so what really is the, the root here? And um, I, I think one of the uh, values that's shared across all sectors um, is, as I mentioned, is this idea of inclusive of the future. Uh, and that is to say, no matter which sectoral advances are, um, by evolution almost, uh, the kind of sectoral exchange modes that we see um, are able, were able to include uh, the future, the future generations, uh, because the civilization that don't, don't exist for us to see. So, so there are some roots uh, in those cultures that at least says uh, we don't foreclose the possibilities of our descendants. We uh, need to be at least a good enough ancestor. Uh, and, and I believe that is one of the, the true roots uh, that could uh, not unify, but rather uh, bridge across the three sectors. I hope that's five minutes. Yeah, that's definitely. Feel free to share more. Sorry, I shouldn't put uh -huh. a, a time cap on that. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Can I, can I just say two things to that? Just, so when I looked at the crossover, I, I was almost feeling the radical civics needs to be the base for those three sectors rather than being the crossover. It's almost the foundation. So, mm -hmm. so building civil society is the base, the root for the other sectors. So that's one thing. The second thing was, I really yeah. liked your perspective here on the civic. The civic is not just in space, but in time. So the kind of thesis of behaving in a civic behavior should not just be the people now, but future generations in that model. So I wonder whether we can expand that thesis of civics by space and time orientation. I think it's really powerful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. A, a shared space time, not not just a shared space. Yeah. Mm. Huh. Thank you, Indy. Anything else, Audrey? Is there any questions when you when you read um, the provocation or is there anything you would like to add? Um, if there is anything that we're missing that we should there's, there's recover. There's plenty, plenty of um, um, edits that I would like to, to make, but most of them would be um, just edits, right? I think the core ideas are sound. Um, of course, I would prefer if there's, there's uh, less words uh, that connects the ideas together uh, because uh, there's like full quotations uh, to illustrate yeah. simple Yes, so, so some outlining would help, uh, but I don't think uh, there's anything uh, that strikes me as particularly missing. Mm. Thank you, Audrey. I think we are still um, developing the hy hypothesis and clear our thinking as we go. So definitely there is a lot of room um, uh, to be improved and we're hoping to continue to develop that, see that as a like, uh, a collaborative note across many different peoples. Um, 
and to improve that as it, as it goes. So definitely it's not a static thing and we're looking to improve it over time. Mm -hmm. So last, um, so last section is about, is the most exciting one, uh, which is about imagining the future experiment. Um, we have, we have um, provide some examples um, like this one. I came, I came across this when I was walking on the street during the weekends. And also tell me if it's like ridiculous or um, there's a lot of um, room that we can build on top of that, imagining that future. So I will, I will probably just to give an example of like different types of uh, futures that we can we can see and co-create together. So uh, one example I thought about uh, that could be an exper experiment on the ground is that uh, imagine if everything is on sale and has sovereignty, so like a land that owns itself. Mm, instead of paying tax, like currently we pay tax and then the tax will be allocated to like maintain or investing uh, public goods. And instead of doing, th doing that, we pay for civic goods through a subscription fee, or we could pay for the use of civic goods, like pay for the use of a park, for example. And we can, we can also crowdfund um, investment through mechanisms like quadratic funding or conviction voting to make certain decisions around where money goes and to use that as a way to vote for the future we like to see. So instead of having a vote or, or one or two votes every four to five years to elect representatives who will decide on so many things for us. Basically, we have the vote, um, like one million or more than that um, in one year to vote for the future we want to invest and we want to see. So everything is self-sovereign and we pay and invest in the future we want to see. So if I want to if I want more community allotments uh, in my community, I could just like crowdfund that or pay for the maintenance of that. The community garden doesn't own by the state or it doesn't own by um, the rich, but it owns itself. So there's no issue of like sometimes public goods um, or like forest will be sell by the government to a developer in order to like build a um, house. And that is not really public um, interest focus. And if the city society is not strong enough to fight back, then probably the tragedy will happen in that way. So this is just an example of how a future can look like um, by passing existing infrastructure and, and, and giving uh, the power to different people and to, to the people actually. And when I, when I thought about this exam, uh, this experiment, I, so, so the team have created a framework um, to, to organize the different strands of inquiries um, as different, like different stacks over here. So the one is the first one is around civic law, and then here you can see um, um, what we want to achieve, like different areas of intervention that we can go forward, and then you can see the small dots are like elements of experiments. So, for example, peer-to-peer -peer feedback can be one specific element of a wider um, wider experiment. So. Here you can see I pick up all different um, elements across different stacks that in inspire me to think about um, this uh, future scenario. So the, the framework on the left is just almost like a, a, a tool or inspiration that help us to imagine the future um, in a more radical way instead of starting from um, a blank page. So should we try, should we try? So we also, um, 
organize a few questions here as a prompt to think about um, different um, different possibilities uh, of the future. So if we can start from uh, the first round of inquiry, and essentially the idea is that we will go through some of the questions uh, we have um, here. So basically this is like the guideline of our conversation, but for this session, as we go through them, we will the the we will build the different experiments for the future that we can <clears throat> then we can do in um then we can conduct in the future. So maybe that's good let's go with the first strand and then see how then see how it goes. So the first strand is around power distribution and decision making. So in the age of digital monopoly and power centralization, we want to imagine that uh, imagine if you are in 2050, what would happen to to make power distribution possible? Because we can see like a lot of things are initially set up as uh, decentralized, like all white web and and Bitcoin, but we can see the trends of centralization. And so in your view, like imagine we're in 2050, what are the pathways forward? What, what can be the pathways forward? How do we delegate and distribute power fairly? Okay, and, and I'm supposed to, to what, take the, the cards on the left or on the further left? Do we shuffle and deal seven cards? Uh, I mean, <laughs> what, 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 what are the moves here? So, so I, um, the idea is to you feel free to just have a conversation using this as a prompt to, to start a conversation. And then your answer is probably starting to, um, is a response to a possibility okay. of the experiment. So probably just like feel free to Maybe, um, can, I, can I suggest something? Yeah. Let's maybe project ourselves in the future, maybe 2040, if it's far enough, and imagine this radical civics, where it would go, where it would lead. And you have all these prompts to help you, but if you're already inspired either by the earlier conversations, the provocation, and so on, uh, feel free to start at any moment or at any specific space. Okay. So, um, so I'm not required to to analyze the the scenario uh, through the the three uh, strands. It's, or, it's a support. It's a support, but not uh, absolutely necessary. Okay. Um, see, um, my my work so far has always been about the plurality, meaning that I don't try to predict the future. I bring a little bit of the future uh, through myself and through the work with the communities uh, every day. Uh, but uh, I remain open to the future because I always believe that people in the future are smarter than me. So, so whatever I do is as materials, as assets for people in the future to remix freely. And this underlies uh, my practice of creative commons, uh, of open source and so on, uh, saying basically uh, that whatever I did are not products, they're just inspirations uh, and materials uh, of sorts. Uh, and so I, I think in, so which is the, the lowercase c conservative in conservative anarchism uh, to me is just uh, not about pushing the world toward any particular state uh, in 2040. It's about conserving the potential for people in the 2040 who are um, unimaginably better uh, suited to solve 2040 questions and problems than me uh, to use whatever we did here in 2021 uh, as materials uh, without being burdened uh, by, for example, um, copyrights, patents, uh, and other existing uh, structure that would foreclose them uh, as uh, the copyrights forecloses uh, useful uh, works uh, for people to use for knowledge and so on. And, and so that's, that's the, the basic idea. So if by 2040 uh, people do see that um, the co-creation makes the intergenerational tension uh, into co-creation and this co-creational um, spirit 
is still very much alive, and I, I don't really um, care really <laughs> about the specifics of how exactly uh, the re-decentralization uh, takes mm -hmm. as long as it's open to the year 2050 and then open to the year 2060. I, I know this is a very meta narrative, uh, but, but really that's uh, the foundation of what I mean by the root of good enough ancestorship. Mm, in your view, what would be if if um, the narrative is about building the materials that um, can be helpful for people um, to to integrate and evolve how the civil society can look like? What would be the the materials or like the essentials of those mm -hmm. materials mm -hmm. look like? Could you sure. give some examples? Sure. Um, so I, I've previously said uh, that any successful social innovation can be analyzed through the fast, fair and fun pillars. Uh, and these pillars, I think, are also important if we are to build a intergenerational view on uh, not just problem solving, but on civic space in, in general, how we solve everyone's problems uh, by making sure it's everyone's business. Right, and not specifically uh, a few persons, representatives, uh, business. So A, it needs to be, be fast, meaning that we need to be uh, building the public, uh, specifically digital, but also physical infrastructures that allows the sense making uh, to propagate through the society quickly. Uh, that's the collective intelligence strand. And it needs to be fair, meaning that people who contribute uh, need to understand reciprocity, uh, understand it's a commons, uh, understand it's not an extractive uh, relationship, uh, and so on. Uh, and so the fairness as a, a norm, that is also important. But I think even more important than fast or fair uh, is fun. Uh, if people find a intrinsic uh, reason to make contributions, then what's unfair or what's unfast uh, uh, can be fixed by co-creation. But if people do not get something intrinsic uh, like fun, sense of shared joy and so on out of it, out of the initial contribution, then they could not progress uh, into um, agenda setting, which requires a lot more energy, right? So um, I, I think, uh, although I said fast, fair, fair, fun, but probably fun is the most important to optimize uh, early on. Hmm, that's great, great. Anyone wanna jump in? I feel like I'm talking too much. Yeah, Audrey, I'd, I'd love to sort of, in a world where, I mean, I was in a conversation where somebody was sort of talking about the scale of trauma some part, some people are facing. Um, and how do you create, how do we create the space for civil society when precarity and actual trauma, like real hard trauma, is on the, on, on the face of it? And how do we, you know, how do we, the fun aspect of it is important, but somehow there seems to be a, almost a foundational space uh, of, of kind of hosting, not hosting, but holding the trauma, letting the pain be, be acknowledged, but at the same time being able to move forward into a civil, civil relationship, which is also going to be critical. Because I think we're facing increasingly a, a more divided and traumatized societies. And the, and the journey to civility, as we have radical civility, is going to require something. I would love your thoughts on, on you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that space. Yeah, well, when I say fun, I don't just mean the onion, which uh, of course it includes the onion, uh, but I, I also uh, mean fun by, for example, looking at mirror board uh, and, and, and smiling at each other and making self introduction in a round to a virtual plant uh, in the middle of us. I, I mean that's that's fun, right? So so uh, in in uh, in the social workers uh, Pollens uh, Bapot can only be built uh, when there is a safe space. So, so Miro, Google Meet, as we're using now, the universal broadband that we're currently enjoying and so on, uh, these are all part of the safe space. These are the material foundations, uh, the enabling condition of the, the safe space. Now, you, you mentioned Facebook, but everybody uses Facebook very differently. Uh, I use Facebook feed eradicator. I don't even have a Facebook feed. Uh, so, so for me, it's just a place for me to search some hashtags and view some videos, not unlike any other video platform. Uh, and, and so uh, I I'm kind of um, not harmed uh, 
uh, by the parasitical um, authoritarian intelligence uh, that powers uh, Facebook's uh, most revenue streams. Uh, and, and I understand, of course, that people would naturally want to form town hall-like civic conversations on Facebook, but I, I see it is kind of fundamentally uh, misguided because uh, it's just like holding a, a real town hall in physical space in a very loud nightclub filled with smoke, people have to shout to get heard, addictive drink, private bouncers, you name it. And, and with all due respect, there is a uh, room for night uh, life district in a city. It's just that this room is not the town hall. Um, and, and so uh, the underlying infrastructure need to have these norms uh, in mind. Uh, so either everybody install Facebook be eradicator or whatever, or we just build uh, public digital infrastructure. And you know, I really appreciate the answer, Audrey. And I suppose one question I had, and I'll stop off this, is that the, the kind of idea of radical civics, so for example, if property rights were not hosted by the state, but were decentralized and distributed, is a transfer of power to what has traditionally been imagined, or money formation wasn't a role of the state, was when uh, or civil law and actually, these are fundamental redistributions of power from straight, Mm -hmm. to a new type of civil society. Mm -hmm. what, what's your feeling about that sort of journey and, um, and the kind of, and, and that plurality of public publics that that generates and the politics of doing that maybe even, what would be the politics of doing that, making that journey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Since you sit in this unique place of sitting in these worlds. Right. Um, so you, you cited, um, if I listen correctly, um, kind of Satoshi Nakamoto as a, a bad example. Did, did I understand that correctly? Or well, I, well I, I, for my view, Bitcoin is a disruption of both private and state simultaneously, right? And I think, I think um, Bitcoin heralds a different future. And I think civil society... I think there's lots of things potentially challenging about it. The deflationary nation, the asset, it will concentrate wealth and other things, but that's different things that we should just think about, whether whether that will provide the justice, and there's lots of things positive mm -hmm, about it. But mm -hmm. in its form, I think it is a civil form. It is, mm -hmm. take, it is a new form of organizing money production, and, and, and I think it heralds this, I think it's a herald of a radical civic. If you want, mm -hmm, if you want mm -hmm, mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think governments are struggling to deal with it. You've seen mm -hmm. recently China, China's response to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you've seen mm -hmm. because it disrupts power of money formation and money control in really, really more from traditional ways. And I think if we imagine it as a herald, it's a really interesting question about how do we build a new relationship between the radical civic route and government and private sector and, and other sectors. So that, that was the nature of the question. So okay. The, 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 yeah. Okay, um, so to, to me, Bitcoin uh, it still runs on top of the internet protocol. It implements, of course, some of the norms that we already had in, say, cypherpunks and other uh, communities, uh, but it's not the first implementation, nor is it the last. It, it's, a, it's the first mainstream application, let, let's call it that. Uh, and uh, which is, um, I, I guess it makes it a good enough ancestor, right? Because first it, um, measurably did uh, inspire more people than any previous distributed ledger implementations. And also, um, Satoshi did not sue anyone for patent infringement. Uh, so people are free to, to do proof of space time, uh, proof of uh, humanity, proof of whatever, uh, without you know, getting legal action from Satoshi. Uh, and, and so I, I, I would say that Bitcoin uh, fits the description of a good enough uh, ancestor. Uh, but uh, it's as for its radicalness or its specificness, I think is just one manifestation of the so-called end-to-end um, -end principle uh, in the internet. 
Uh, and I think the end-to-end -end principle, uh, which says uh, that innovation can happen as long as two willing people anywhere in the network consent to it. Uh, I think that is truly radical, as in, in the root. Uh, Bitcoin unleashed some of that promise of the core internet, uh, but there are many more. Uh, and, and to me, internet is more radical uh, in a radical civic sense than Bitcoin uh, by orders of magnitude. And the relationship of government to these sort of devices, because yeah, I think so, there's a so the PRC did not ban the internet. So, <laughs> right. So, so it means that uh, it, it was successful in uh, mainstreaming even more stakeholders so that uh, the uh, kind of tolerance of the disruptive potential of future internet applications, um, even very high. Um, but also the incentive uh, for a state to allow its almost parasitical uh, existence is still very high, uh, which is partly why PRC banned, um, you know, uh, the Bitcoin related websites, but it did not ban GitHub uh, for exactly the same reason. Uh, and so I, I guess the, the co-creation part, the, the fun part really uh, of say GitHub or other uh, internet-based open source uh, infrastructure uh, pose a, a very attractive uh, force for state governments, even authoritarian ones. And at this particular stage, I, I think they, they need probably uh, to be symbiotic uh, in order to work with, um, certainly not for uh, the radical civics. Uh, but if we see um, the radical civics as a symbiotic instead of parasitical force, that already is something, right? It's not something that people do when they get cognitive surplus. Uh, this is not something that people do uh, to uh, reform the government. This is something that is symbiotic uh, with the other sectors. Anyone want to jump in? I was wondering about uh, the market's role in, uh, uh, in appropriating the values created uh, open uh, through open source protocols, open source work, uh, and then uh, accumulating uh, the value in profits and private uh, 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 shareholder value. And how, uh, what kind, I mean, do we have examples of uh, uh, material infrastructures that are trying to upend those dynamics uh, so that the so that the value that is created through open networks is sort of uh, kept for the ancestors uh, as open value rather than closed private value. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So systems that are, are fair uh, to, yes. to its, its participants. Yes. We, we do have plenty of these uh, systems. And I see a uh, related question uh, in, in the chat uh, that says, how about um, how, how do Bitcoin evolve, basically? Uh, and and so uh, so actually tackling that question leads to to answering your question. So the Bitcoin successors tackle that through different consensus schemes, right? Uh, proof of space time, as in Filecoin. Proof of stake, as in uh, Ethereum 2.0, uh, and and things like that. And and all these are basically redesigning such that uh, it's it's more fair. Uh, fair for the planet, fair for the uh, external society, fair for uh, up and coming participants in the network instead of dominated uh, by a few uh, persons in the beginning of the revolution, right? And, and things like that. So uh, in a sense that that's their, uh, uh, not just climate change mitigation and transformation, but also uh, a broader sustainability uh, transformation because uh, without these actions, it would not be sustainable, meaning that the externalities, uh, negative ones, will be so large that the uh, surrounding society and business will start to boycott them, as we have seen recently uh, with Bitcoin. And so there's a larger social norm. There's a larger social force here. So how to make sure that these radical civics uh, which show the promise of radical co-creation across sectors um, remains fair uh, in a wider societal norm. Uh, of course, that means that we need to deliver something that is perceived as more fair 
to the existing society norm. That is to say, it needs to be Pareto improvements. If, uh, if one makes a innovation that makes it more fair for a few people or a few percentage of people, but reduce the fairness, reduce equity for the other part of the people, I'm not just talking about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is a good example, uh, then uh, of course, then uh, it will not be tolerated uh, for a long time by the surrounding society. Um, on the other hand, for example, the crowd uh, sourced sense making of air pollution in Taiwan, uh, the digital competence co-creation of uh, the counter disinformation, uh, what we call humor over rumor or uh, making sure there's notice with no takedown but public notice and so on. We can actually tangibly prove that the time you put into it increase uh, the social equity without leaving any particular part behind. Uh, and the reason why we can prove that is because Taiwan has as its constitutional core, universal broadband education, uh, communication uh, as a right to citizens. So it's not just uh, that the state has the responsibility to fulfill uh, the infrastructure, but people expect these uh, to be part of the dignity uh, of citizenship. And so when we introduce uh, such co-creation materials, uh, people do not uh, simply say, oh, what about people uh, with no broadband access? Because people know, well, that's solved on the underlying layer. Right? People don't say, what about people who are not part of the universal health care? Uh, do they get mass migration? What about immigrant workers? Uh, because on the underlying layer, they are already included in universal health care. And the importance is not that it's state run. The importance is that it's a fair expectation that's always delivered uh, by the social sector, even when the state, uh, through its numerous omissions, for example, forget uh, to uh, recompensate for telemedicine uh, because the IC card was uh, IC card based. Right. Uh, then people are prompted to innovate uh, on telemedicine and various other ways to uh, kind of augment the existing omissions. And by relinquishing their copyright and patents, the state were able then uh, through presidential hackathon and other means, uh, just make sure that it continues to observe the social norm by delivering part of that infrastructure. So um, so this is a, a really long run on sentence, <laughs> but I, I, I trust that, that you understand the, the, the main idea. It, it's Pareto improvement across sectors that not just conform but evolves a social norm that's already upheld by all the sectors related uh, to that particular endeavor. So just one question related to what you mentioned earlier about um, like the long welfare system like UBI mm -hmm. as a foundational enabling um, condition to support the, the, the civic actions in society. I wonder, because you mentioned earlier about everything um, is included already. I wonder how does that how how does that look like, and how does that work for those countries that doesn't have those conditions in in place? Um, how so just, Taiwan just... did not have universal health care, so universal health care was only introduced after Taiwan's first uh, citizen assembly style deliberation. Uh, and but it's in the history books, so people can look it up. Yeah. Mm. And Jonathan? just, just wanting to be mindful of time, uh, we had an hour, correct? That's um, right. Yes. And and Audrey, I know you're really busy. So uh, is it a hard stop for you at? Uh, uh, it's not a particularly hard stop, uh, yeah. but is, is ST here? Uh, I think ST is still yeah. here. Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi. So uh, how, how are you on time? Uh, do you have a hard stop or can you continue um, in, in my absence? Uh, yeah, sure. But uh, I'm not quite sure because I missed the... The, the, the context. That's before, yes. So ah, too bad. Maybe, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah may, maybe I, I, I can stay on for another five, ten minutes. Mm, thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you, Audrey. Jonathan, do you want to come in and then, and look at any um, questions that we have to just to bring bring to the table before we close? I think I would just let anybody else who uh, has been thinking through this conversation, um, if there's any question or thoughts or ideas or worry about the future of that space? I, I mean, I suppose I'll sort of keep going until somebody else has another question, so just punch me out of the way. Um, 
I really enjoy the precision of your words, Audrey, I suppose. Um, because in a way, as I hear them, like the space, so the co-creation capability is almost the foundation of civic. It's how can you, co that's, that's the basic of civics. And then growing fairness is almost the intentionality. Who is involved in their co-creational capability? And, the, it, and it's not, it can never be everyone. So it's the growing capability of, of that. That's really the issue. Growing in space and in time. So that's actually the kind of vector quality of it. And, and, um, and in time, as I was sort of reconciling what you were saying, you were saying, actually, we have to create systems which are, allow the, for maintaining the potentiality of future generations and conserving their potentiality. So that's the kind of almost the definition of civics that I, uh, that I sort of uh, was able to understand. And then I suppose one of the things I suppose, we're, and this may be wrong as well, let's have that honest conversation, is, you know, what if we were to start to think about money production in, a, in, in, a, in, in that sort of way? What if we were to start to say, well, actually, the current reality is certainly in the UK, very few people have access to justice. You have the idea of justice, but the access to justice no longer exists. So Amazon terms and sheets, it's virtually impossible, but actually the practical. So we know we're increasingly democracies are struggling to deliver justice. Um, so we have to reinvent the thesis of justice in the 21st century, which allows for a different form of micro accountability and me mechanisms of rest redress in a new way. And that's going to be different from the institutions that we had. Um, we know that actually our registries that we're about to build, they could be built from a completely different thesis that would make the public and pluralize the public rather than centralize the public. So the plurality of publics becomes... So there feels like a moment of radical institutional reform that could actually empower building this radical civic base and allow government to have new integrity in that process as well. Do you, do you feel the hypothesis we're running is valid? As, mm -hmm. a, as yeah. a kind of a, sure. as a generic yeah. hypothesis? Certainly it's valid uh, and we're, of course, in the middle of the great accelerator uh, for that, right? The, the yeah. twin uh that affects the humanity with the same urgency and therefore allows people to find common topics across time zones. Uh, prior to this, it was not possible. So, <laughs> right, uh, I, I could talk about the weather, but it would not make sense uh, for you. But if I talk about SMS check-in, you know, suddenly it resonates. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so uh, I think the capacity for co-creation it's dependent on the urgency, and because of the sheer urgency that we have now. I think uh, the, the demos over demics, right? The, the power of democracy over the pandemic and infodemic uh, is felt in the same urgency in pretty much all the democratic polities. And that creates a remarkably, um, the, the word I like to use is the conflict-free uh, replicable data type. Uh, it, it's a math term, uh, it, it's a term, or CRDT, it's a yeah. mathematics term. Uh, it underlies the Google Doc, the Google Meet, the mirror board. Right? It's the mathematical infrastructure that allows us to simultaneously make edits uh, and just like Bitcoin, arrive on some consensus that is consistent uh, across uh, fairly trusting uh, parties. Uh, and without the CRDTs, most of our time in the battle days uh, in version control in open source is uh, spent on resolving conflicts, is spent on de-escalation. Uh, and if you think about it, de-escalation is what you do if the bit rate of democracy is less than that of conflict, uh, yeah. you're basically playing catch up, right? A uh, batch catch up uh, to, to de escalate. But if yeah. you do have a higher bit rate for co creation and democracy, then you experience the kind of conflict free, uh, repl replicable because of the universal broadband is spreads fast uh, data type. Uh, and that, I think, is the foundation for the kind of the, the radical civic that you just described, because without which there's no motivation for people to participate in it. And this system does not bootstrap without the initial participation across all the different sectors. Exactly. And, and it, just to keep building with that. So one of the things that's that I think is challenging is to too often in many conversations we tend to look for consensus systems um so whether it's through representation or through voting mm -hmm. and and actually consensus systems in complex emergent environments are really problematic 
because there is no single consensus. It is contextually mm-hmm. variant. So co-creation allows for, as you said, this simple end-to-end principle where if two people can agree it, then actually there's a, cons- there's a space. That's right. Uh-huh. And, and it deals with the problem of complexity, not through representation or group think or group consensus, but actually through a new form of public accountability through the end-to-end mm-hmm. principle with mm-hmm. the transparency of process. Mm-hmm. So there's almost mm-hmm. a different route of organizing mm-hmm. rather than the representational democracy route mm-hmm. of organizing. Mm-hmm. But, but w- which changes the, our models of legitimacy from mm-hmm. being the vote to mm-hmm. being open, transparent, um, mm-hmm. end-to-end, principle oriented There, there mm-hmm. seems to be a root, pro- root question that you're bringing to the table, right? Exactly, exactly. Because uh, in previous literature on deliberative democracy, uh, representativeness uh, is seen as important to legitimacy, and therefore you either obtain it through the vote or through the random sortition, uh, both dates back uh, yeah. to ancient Greece. Uh, yeah. However, uh, this way of uh, working uh, is essentially self-selection. Uh, people who are interested in forming autocracy uh, and explore, but share with the society through open innovation and so on, the internet governance model. Uh, but self-selection uh, really is just a, a kind of lens uh, through which uh, that the public administration and existing uh, policy infrastructure understand the kind of co-creation we're talking here. Uh, in our world, it's called the end-to-end principle, right? Uh, it's not called self-selection. And and so if we keep building with it, the integrity of that process. So I, I remember when we spoke last time, in, when you were uh, t- mm-hmm. in Canada, you were talking about why you keep these recordings because it's an mm-hmm. integrity mm-hmm. principle, right? Mm-hmm. It allows you to show integrity in terms of anyone can say, "Well, I did this." And the future is watching. Yes. Yeah, yes. Exactly. So uh-huh. so so, it, so the governance becomes less about um, uh, representation and control, but more about integrity of behavior, mm-hmm. and actually. In, in not enforcing, but certainly encouraging and feedbacking that integrity of behavior. So there's a new theory of governance that starts to emerge in the system. And the mm-hmm. role of government less is about control or represent, representation, but actually integrity, organization, and building integrity in the system through feedback, not necessarily through control. And I think mm-hmm. feedback and enablement becomes very powerful mechanisms. Can you see... Mm-hmm. I mean, are you seeing some of that stuff happen in your government leadership? The same? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, And I I resonate well uh, with the part uh, that says relationship uh, takes the front uh, seat uh, in the radical civics design because uh, indeed relationship um, lives through our interactions and and they are really uh, what we're here for. Right. Uh, and and to, to call them uh, human capital or whatever, uh, relational capital is kind of a perverse category uh, because uh, they, they are, in a sense, the agent here. And then we are just the vehicles through which the agency of relationships happen. Uh, and, and once uh, that view is taken, then you get into much easier uh, co-creation. And this is uh, why I keep saying that the Mandarin word gongshi or good enough consensus uh, or common understanding really uh, is basically something that's alive, that uh, lives through us. Uh, but the English word consensus is too fine. It's, it suggests a contract that people find. Uh, and, and so I always modify it as in the internet governance tradition, rough consensus or good enough consensus, as I'm, I mostly uh, say nowadays. And, and, and if we go with your relationships part, it means that the idea of identity is less about me and my certainty but almost a function of uh, the Heidelberg uncertainty of relationships, almost a cluster of relationships mm-hmm. that allow mm-hmm. me to, ex- that, that, that correlate on me. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah. Well, our shared experience, basically this yes. mirror board is alive and we're just, it's tentacles, sorry, vehicles. Yeah, exactly. So whereas current thesis on identity always about is a, single proof ground truth or the idea of a ground truth or whereas actually what we want to embrace is not ground truth but your idea of rough consensus of identity in a way which is a function of multiple relationships correlating mm-hmm. around that and that starts to build mm-hmm. a completely different thesis mm-hmm. of identity formation mm-hmm. well, a, overlapping uh, relationship but yes uh-huh. yeah yes. Uh-huh. okay because I, I think these conceptual frames are quite critical because they will underpin how we d- build some of the root structures Mm-hmm. that are necessary for this for this story. No, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm hogging up so much time. And so, uh, guys, no, please, it's fine. Come, 
Yeah. No worries. Uh, unfortunately, like I feel like we could have a few hours of this conversation and we're barely scratching the first surface, but we already asked for 10 minute extra. So I feel like we unfortunately have to conclude. So I'll, let, I'll leave it to Fang for the last few words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for um, everyone's time. And we really appreciate this conversation that we're happening, uh, that is happening right now and feel like we we probably should have more time um, ne next time or we can have like a fluid we'll, we'll always conversation. Feel like that. No, no matter yeah. how many hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think this mirror board will just keep open and, and if anyone wanna um, like add anything to it or raise any questions, I think we would just leave it open and people still can interact um, on Miro. And really sorry that we went over time. Um, That's fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so I think for the next steps, probably we will just continue to develop um, the mm. thinking, the hypothesis and um, and think about like the essentials that we can create. Because we also don't want to just um, stay um, in the space of um, theoretical um, mm -hmm. kind of arguments, but mm -hmm. wanting to see how that future um, can be realized through distributed actions. Like mm -hmm. we, we, we were really con like conscious about um, us. We don't want to be the, the holder of this conversation, even though we are initiating this, but we want to make sure that there is a space for everyone in the society to be mm -hmm. able to tap into the space and develop things further. Mm -hmm. And so we're still experimenting what would be the best way to keep the different conversations flow and and even people from different conversations can have a conversation um, in a different space. So we'll definitely keep in touch um, sure. with you. Of course. Well, live long and prosper then. <laughs> Thank you so much, Audrey, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Uh, should I? Just wondering, should I stop the recording here, yeah. or, or do you want to have like uh, before we? Okay. Let me stop the recording.